Hello, I'm John Chandler. I'm going to be talking today about case study research, which I think is a really important topic, but I would say that, wouldn't I? Um, I think it's important because, for one thing, a lot of students in their final year dissertation do uh, case study research. Um, they base um, their research on a case study of an organisation. And the other reason it's important is that in business and management research generally, there's a lot of stuff that's based on case study research. So it is an important topic, I think, for you individually and generally. Um, I think the thing about um, case study research, though, is to not confuse it with the kind of case studies you see in, used in teaching or in textbooks. Because obviously you're used to these small vignettes that are presented in, in textbooks as cases of this or that. Case study research is not like that and not to be confused with this. Um, and I'll explain why hopefully later. So what are we going to do today in the lecture? Well, basically I'm going to look at uh, what, uh, why and how. What is case study research? Why do we do it? And how do we do it? Those are the basic uh, points that I want to cover. And in doing so, I draw upon this book uh, mainly, Robert Yin's Case Study Research, um, which if you do read up on case study research as published, almost inevitably, the researcher will refer to Yin. This is the leading kind of book on case study research, the leading researcher in uh, case study research, you could argue, in the world. He's an American, uh, lots of experiences you might expect of case study research. Uh, I don't always agree with Yin, and this will become clear later, I think, that there's a few things where I might take issue, but I thought it'd be useful to base this lecture around Yin's own work. So let's start with case study research as a method. Yin himself produces this list of methods, um, experiments, surveys, archival analysis, history, case study. So it, case study seems to be positioned as one of a series of methods. Um, we're all familiar perhaps with the experiment, with the survey, with perhaps less so archival research, but you can imagine going into written dusty archives with uh, written material and looking at old company records. Um, these are distinct methods as, case, as um, Yin describes it. Actually, I'm not sure that I would position case study as a method for reasons which we'll come on to, because in a sense, case study re requires you to use a variety of methods of data collection. It might actually include a survey. It might include uh, archival research, as well as interviews and so on. Um, but certainly, it is distinct from experiments, distinct from a survey that perhaps um, only uses survey questionnaire type techniques as ways of collecting data. What is the case? What is important perhaps when we're talking about case studies is to bear in mind that the case under view could be anything almost. It could be an individual. We could do a case study of one chief executive. We could do a case study of one manager. Um, well, maybe you'd say that's unlikely, but you could do. Um, if you think about Freud's work, for example, he was looking at patients he had and thinking and looking at those as individuals. So we can look at individuals. We can look at groups of people. So it might be a group in a particular department or a team that we're interested in within an organisation. Or we could see the organisation itself as a case. Um, so looking at the organisation as a whole. So the case under consideration could be any of these things. And there could be more, one, more than one case as well. It's not necessary to just focus on a single case. There may be good reasons, in fact, for doing multiple cases and studying one or two organisations, uh, maybe two or three organisations. And I'll give an example of this later as well. That so sometimes you want to contrast cases or see what the similarities and differences between cases are. So that case study research is not just necessarily based on a single case, but it could be. So what is a case study research? Well, Yin defines it in a rather complicated way. 
first of all, he says, a case study is an empirical inquiry. So it's obviously trying to find out from data in the real world um, what's going on. But it investigates contemporary phenomenon within their real life context. So we're looking at the real world, if you like, as it's going on. So it's very different in that sense to the experiment where we're artificially creating perhaps situations, uh, perhaps in a laboratory even. Um, and obviously it's unlike the survey where we're sending out questionnaires to people to get them to complete it. In case study research, we're looking at the world as it's going on, the organization or the individual as they're um, actually living, but we're setting that in context, a real life context. And the second bullet point there, the boundaries between phenomena and context are not clearly evident, may be, seem a bit obscure. But what he's saying there is that if we're interested in something like, I don't know, the way, the way in which an information system um, works, then the context of that, the, the way people use it, perhaps the sorts of decisions about how it was Im implemented, how it was brought in even, where does the boundary lie between the context and the system that we're focusing on. And in case study research, it's not always clear cut. And actually, we want to look at the context in which these phenomena occur. But Yin goes on to give some more points about case study. First of all, he says that cases deal with, case study research deals with uh, what are technically distinctive situations where there's more variables of interest than there are data points, which is a very, I think, quite obscure thing to say. I think what he's saying is that compared with, say, the experiment, where you often reduce things to two variables, the dependent and the independent variable, and you're looking at data points for those two variables, so you're measuring various things, um, and perhaps charting a graph with uh, uh, along those two dimensions. So you've got two variables and lots of data points. But in case study research, it's not like that. If you're looking at information systems, then you may have lots of variables that are important. All the people using it, the various criteria they're employing, the technical aspects to deal with. Lots and lots of variables. And actually, in real life, you probably can't measure, if you like, all of those variables in it to any great degree. So lots of variables, lots of complexity within case study research, and you can't hope to measure and capture all the data that you might ideally want to. The next bullet point is about multiple sources of evidence. Because it's complex, he's saying, Yin's saying, that you need to use multiple sources of evidence. So if you're looking at information systems, you might be talking to people in interviews and trying to get their ideas about what's going on. But equally, you might be looking at the data itself in the system, the archives, and so on, the, the documents. So you're using multiple sources of evidence within case study research, not just a single source. And together, those multiple sources hopefully triangulate on something like the full complex reality. And the final point there is a controversial one, but it's about um, the beneficial nature of developing prior theoretical propositions to guide data collection and analysis. So one of the examples he gives is that you might be interested in how reorganization benefits implementation of management information systems. And what he's saying is it's best to set up some sort of theory, some sort of proposition uh, that you can test out. Um, and that's um, one of the things I'm not so sure about, actually, in terms of Yin's definitions. So you'll see quite a complex way of defining case study research. I think maybe, arguably, it's too complex. But I'll come on to that in a minute. Multiple sources of evidence. I mentioned what we might use. Um, and again, Yin gives lots of different examples of the sorts of data that you might use and the sources of data that can be used. So you can use documents, archival records. Lots of companies have archives that can be explored and worked with. Much um, use is often made of interviews. 
who are you going to interview, of course, is an interesting issue. But you can also use direct observations. You can wander around the organisation, if, if the organisation is a focus of attention, and look at what's going on. You can use participant observation. You might be a member of this organisation as a manager or as an um, employee. And you can look at physical artefacts, you know, the kinds of um, even logos that are used in the organisation, the way things are laid out, perhaps, all sorts of things. So, depending upon the nature of the study, depending upon the research question you have, these different sources of evidence could be used. He's not saying you should use all of these things. You don't have to go through every single one of the list, but some of these things are important. Going back to Yin's definition of case study research, I have some doubts about the definition. Firstly, I think it's unnecessarily complicated. I'll offer a simpler definition in a minute. I think you could see case study research in simpler terms than the one he's um, introducing. Um, but also his approach to case study research and his definition is based upon a, advocating a particular approach, a particular way of doing case study research that he believes in very strongly. Uh, for example, this business about setting up propositions that you test. And I'm not sure that's necessarily uh, true of all good case study research. Some ethnographic case study research, for example, doesn't set, start off with a hypothesis or a proposition at all. It develops theory inductively, and I'll talk about that a little in a bit. Um, and also, it's rather uh, limited. In other words, that, for example, why should you even necessarily uh, use multiple sources of evidence? Um, I think, for example, taking Freud's work, although lots of psychologists would uh, feel that it's been discredited, it's nevertheless an interesting body of work and theory based upon a single method of interviewing patients effectively. So I'm not even convinced that multiple methods is um, a defining feature of case study research. Um, so my alternative definition, which is a lot simpler, <laughs> is that case study research is, involves the selecting a limited number of sites as the basis for investigation, maybe just one or two. Um, and by sites, again, I mean those could be individuals or they could be organisations or they could be departments, whatever you like. So to me, it, case study research is about the focus of investigation, the field of investigation that you're defining. Um, simple as that. Um, it's about a field of investigation. And also it's not therefore a method because the method of investigation, the method of data collection, might be variable. So you might use even a survey, or you might use interviews, or you might use observation, or all three or four of those um, of methods. Obviously, an objection to this is that it's just far too broad, that it kind of covers almost everything then, anything that investigates a particular field in its um, real life context. Um, it certainly does leave lots of questions open about how you conduct the investigation. What should you do? How should you set it up? Uh, but it seems to me that's not a bad thing or a limitation. Um, but that moves us on to the issue of how. How do we do case study research? What should we do? Um, but first of all, before we deal with the how of it, what about the why of it? Now, Yin's answer to this is that it helps us to look at how and why questions, how things operate in the real world, how an information system, if that's the focus, for example, how it does operate, what makes it work well, um, if it does. Uh, why questions, why do things go wrong, or why um, do information systems sometimes work out well and sometimes not? Those sorts of why questions. He thinks case study research is very good um, way of exploring, particularly in the case of contemporary events when, again, we're dealing with things in their real life context. And you don't want to set up an experiment, an artificial situation where you're controlling the situation. Uh, you want to see things, how things 
operate in the real world. And he thinks case study research enables you to answer how and why questions, the mechanics, if you like, of how things work. Um, now these how and why questions could be seen as simple causal models, you know, chains of causation. So if we take his information systems example, how do you move from reorganization of the organization through to effective information systems? Um, so you can set up a model that maybe you'd represent it diagrammatically as a flow of, um, you know, uh, of uh, one thing leading to another. But equally, from perhaps a more sociological perspective, you could say, well, we're not just interested in causation, we're interested in understanding people's, what people mean by certain things. Um, we're understanding, we want to understand the complexity of people's feelings, maybe even about information systems change or whatever. Maybe that's our focus. So this comes on to the philosophy of science in a sense. What are we trying to do? Are we trying to explain in causal terms or are we trying to understand in meaning term, meaningful terms? But it seems to me that case study research could do either. It could answer the how and why questions either in causal terms um, or in um, understanding people's motives and meanings. What about the issue about generalization though? What are the key limitations perhaps that people might see of case study research is that if we're selecting a limited number of cases, one or two cases maybe, how can you possibly generalize? Well, one answer is you can't, you know, and that, therefore this is one of the problems. Um, you can't generalize from one or two cases to the population. If information systems work this way in this organization, how do you know that it's going to work in the same way in a different organization? You could say you can't. Um, particularly if you're used to the idea of statistical analysis, and let's say basing your survey research, of course, is often based upon trying to get a representative sample of the population so that you can be fairly confident about your generalizations from the sample to the wider population. Well, if you've got a sample of one, you could say that's impossible to generalize to the wider population. That's the limitation. Um, but Yin draws a distinction between statistical generalization and analytical generalization. He says that, of course, you can't uh, generalize in a statistical sense to the wider population, but you can create models of causa causation, for example, and explore the hows and the whys, the mechanics of how things work, and that enables you to make analytical generalizations. In other words, you can build up models of how things work that could apply to this case, but they can, because they're robust models, also be generalized to other cases. Um, so he believes in using case study research to build up theory, but that's about analytical generalization, building up models that can be applied in other contexts. To what extent they apply in different cases, of course, is maybe a, a something to investigate. So you might have produce a model of information systems implementation based on one case study um, that may or may not apply everywhere else. And the extent to which it applies everywhere else, you may want to investigate. And that illustrates, I think, the idea that you can use case studies to produce theories of general utility. And again, Freud's work, maybe, even if you think it's discredited, could be seen as an example of building up from cases, from a limited number of cases, some general theory, psychoanalytic theory in this case, that could be applied uh, more generally. And I think that's the sort of thing that Yin has in mind, if not Freudian, in Freudian terms, that sort of idea of building up theory that can be of general interest. So that's the why. But also, I think, pragmatically, and this is me talking rather than Yin, I'm, I believe in the pragmatics of research, particularly if you're doing research as a student. Um, the one big advantage of case study research is it usually doesn't need a huge amount of time or money to do. You can go into an organisation, you can interview people, collect a few documents relatively cheaply, particularly if you know people in that organisation and if you work there. So 
it is a cheap way of doing it, it's a pragmatic way of doing it, particularly from a student point of view, and that's why, partly why, a lot of students do their uh, dissertations based upon single cases. It also makes the most of any access you have. A lot of students do have access to an organisation, perhaps because they work in it or have worked in it or they have contacts in an organisation. And the case study research enables you to make use of those contacts. And the final reason I give here is it may be what your boss wants. Sometimes people, particularly part-time students, uh, want to do a project based in their workplace, or maybe their boss wants them to do a project based in their workplace that has some payoff for that organisation. And again, as pr in pragmatic terms, it seems to make sense for me to do uh, case study research for that reason. So these pragmatic reasons are, I think, very good reasons for choosing case study research methods. Now let's deal with an example. I've, been, I've looked at the what is a case study and why we do it, but in fairly abstract terms, I'm very conscious of that. So I'd like to give you an example of a piece of case study research that is you know, published and that shows you perhaps the, why it's done but also how it's done because I want to move on next to the how of case study research and this piece of research I think gives a good um, some good understanding of how it might be done so let, if you could read this case study first um, and then answer the questions based upon that case study and that's a good basis for understanding how research based on case studies can be done so if we break there. So let's move on to the issue about how we do cases. How do we do a case study? Um, now, first of all, there isn't one right way of doing it. Particularly if you take my broad definition of cases and we move away from Yin's own particular take on it. Of course there isn't one way of doing it. And in fact, I think it's useful to think of research generally as a set of decision-making processes that we go through, you know, and initially we should start always with our research question. What is it that we are trying to find out? What is it that we're trying to answer? And that obviously should guide you in terms of the selection of cases and in terms of perhaps the kind of methods that you want to um, use to collect data. What is your research question? Start with that and then say, well, given this research question, do I have a single case or a multiple case? Multiple cases can be useful if we're trying to compare and contrast uh, organisations. Sometimes though, depending upon our question, one case is perfectly good enough. Um, do we want to compare and contrast? Do we want to explore differences? Do we want to see how a large organisation copes with something compared with a small one? Obviously, if we do, then we do need to have a mixture of cases. And then, if you've decided single or multiple cases, the other issue is, well, what cases do we use? 
Now, this gets us on to the issue of generalisation, so to speak, um, perhaps, because you might be saying to yourself, well, I want to choose a typical case because I want to generalise the um, population. So if I take a typical case, I'm going to be able to do that. But in a sense, again, going back to the issue about statistical generalisation, analytical generalisation, that's maybe not the way to think about it. And in fact, sometimes critical cases might tell you more than typical cases. We might take an extreme case and that might give us a good understanding of um, particular situations. So sometimes extreme cases help. The other issue is theory. Yin, as I've said, tends to say we should start with theory, we should start with a proposition, a hypothesis effectively, and then use that theory and the hypothesis and test it within rigorously in the case. Now, I think this is problematic and controversial. Um, in fact, if you take ethnographic studies that are case studies effectively, where people enter a particular field or maybe an organisation and try to understand the way that organisation works as a kind of cultural entity, then they don't tend to go in with prior theories. They tend to try to talk to people in the organisation, see how it works and develop an understanding of it, a rich, complex understanding of it. It's inductive um, research. It's producing theory, perhaps, but through interaction with the data that they collect. It, the theory doesn't come first. Now, it seems to me that inductive approach or the deductive approach can both be legitimate. Um, you can want to decide which way you want to go. And so I think, in a, but you should be clear from the outset, of course, which of these you want to do. Do you want to work um, theory up inductively or do you want to start with a hypothesis that you want to test? That's maybe a decision you've got to make from the outset. Theory or art. Um, Yin's example of a theoretical pro proposition, one of his examples he gives is this, the organisational restructuring is needed to make MIS implementation work, management information system implementation work, which is a kind of broad hypothesis that you might say makes sense and maybe this comes out of you know, the reading that you've been doing on the topic. But the point about that kind of prior proposition is from Yin's point of view it helps to make um, helps you to make some decisions about what is relevant and what isn't. Obviously in this case you would want to look at organisational restructuring and somehow find out how that organisation has restructured, assuming it has, and you do obviously need to find information on uh, the management information systems implementation. So there's some boundaries, if you like, that are set up um, around what is relevant and what isn't. But Above all, he thinks you should be testing the theory, you should be testing the proposition rigorously. And he thinks that by exploring the issue in detail from a case study point of view, you can look at the hows and whys. How is it that reorganisation makes it work or perhaps doesn't? Um, what are the exact mechanisms through which it does? So it's not just the general proposition you're testing, but the hows and the whys of of things. But obviously you should have an open mind and you, the test might be one that is disconfirmed. You might find that you have a case study organisation where MIS implementation worked fine and there wasn't any reorganisation and obviously you've tested the hypothesis and found that actually it's not always necessarily the case. But again, why is it not the case? Why in that organisation, in that case, um, did it work anyway? As I said though, in ethnographic studies, you wouldn't necessarily start with the uh, proposition. You would explore inductively what uh, is going on in this case. And although ethnographic studies often do take a long time, it is possible even in a short um, student 
piece of research in one semester, possibly to do an ethnographic study or something like it. And certainly ethnography is one of the issues we're going to explore in another of these uh, lectures. More decisions, yet more decisions. Do you have a flexible or closed design? By flexible we mean that you don't go into the case study research with ab an absolutely clear idea of who you're going to talk to or even what methods of data collection you're going to use. You might be quite flexible because you don't know who to talk to, you don't know what documents exist, you don't know exactly how you're going to find out whatever you need to find out how to answer your research question. So a fixed design would be a very clear um, set of data collection methods that you've specified in advance. Flexible is open-ended. Now again, it's maybe sensible to decide on this in advance. Are you going to be fixed or flexible? And a lot of the case you need to be flexible perhaps. What source of evidence are you going to use is another decision to take. All those different methods of data collection we talked about, observations, um, interviews and so on, which methods are you going to use? These are decisions that have to be made. And obviously any decision not to do something has implications. Does it reduce the validity of your study? Are you missing out on a whole um, set of data that actually might be quite important? So that's important. Whatever source of evidence you use, how are you going to record it? If you are interviewing people, are you going to tape record it? Um, obviously, that they may not want you to do it. It may be difficult because of the environment you're in. You know, I had a colleague who's doing research in India, um, with, and he, he tried to record interviews and found actually when he played them back, they were inaudible because the fans and noise of the street and so on were so great that it just made the recordings completely un un unintelligible. So how are you going to record the data and how are you going to organise it? Uh, case study research can very quickly produce a lot of different data, a lot of um, not just interviews but documents. So you need a good filing system basically, you need to find a way of organising that data. Um, professional researchers often use these days qualitative uh, research software in Vivo, Atlas and so on to try to organise some of this data. Um, as a student, that's probably, it's probably not worth investing your time to learn this software, but you need some sort of um, good filing system yourself. And the other issue is how much evidence are you going to collect? In the example we gave of case study research that hopefully you've read, um, you know, a lot of interviews were conducted, a lot of documents were collected. As a student, you might not have the time to do that many interviews and collect that much data, but you've got to decide what, when enough is enough. And it's not an easy decision to make, but it's a decision you've got to make. Then there's the issue of access. To whom do you need access? Obviously there's the organisation maybe that you're wanting to get access to, but also the individuals within it. What level of seniority do you need access to? Um, and whose permission do you need? And I could tell you some kind of difficult stories of uh, student research projects I've supervised where they thought they had agreed access and then later on someone else's um, come along and more senior management has come along and said actually no I don't like what's going on here I think we need to stop it and obviously for a student that's disastrous if your research project is stopped halfway through. Um, that, so you need to think very carefully about whose permission you need and whether they have the authority that um, you need to um, rely on. And the other issue, or whole set of issues that arises in case study research is ethical issues. I mean, generally, obviously, things like anonymity you might want to promise to people. But this can be quite difficult to ensure in a case study, organisational case study research context. Um, there may be one person you interview who says certain things that are sensitive within the organisation. Um, if that person is in a unique position and in the report of the 
research you're disclosing that position. It's no good just not using their name, is it? Everyone would know, reading the report, who that is. So you need to be clear about what you're promising if you're promising anonymity and also the issues of informed consent, don't do harm, behaving with integrity. All these ethical issues are very important to think through and perhaps to write about in the report of your research when you write it up. Um, but case study research does sometimes pose, impose certain quite tricky ethical dilemmas or ethical difficulties which need to be thought through. But again, there's a whole range of issues, decision-making issues, decisions to take about ethics and how you're going to implement them. The other thing we need to think about in terms of the how to do the case study research is how we're going to write it up. Um, and that needs to be thought about even actually before you collect the data. And certainly even while you're collecting data, it can be worth writing up. Um, I would always encourage students to start the write-up even while the data collection is uh, occurring. In fact, before data collection occurs, you can be um, writing about the decisions you've made about how to set the case study up, such as fixed or, uh, fixed or flexible designs and so on. And it's worth writing up as you go along. The other issue about uh, how to do it is principles of data collection. Yin's principles are threefold. We've talked about the use of multiple sources of evidence that Yin is very keen on, and I've said maybe you don't always need multiple sources, but clearly you've got to think about uh, what sources to use, and those are decisions to make. But the other thing he says about this, given that you've got multiple sources of evidence, he also says you've got to kind of have a database, and by that he doesn't mean necessarily an access kind of um, computer based database, but some sort of organized system whereby all your um, data is sorted out and organized so that you can retrieve things readily and you can uh, easily find something that you need. And that requires sometimes some um, careful consideration. And actually the issue about your own thoughts and actions, what did you do and when did you do it, it's worth sometimes keeping a journal or a diary of what, your, of what you did and when so that you can remind yourself and have some reflections on the process. And sometimes those issues can be discussed in the report and actually you can get credit for showing some reflection on the process. But also the related to this is a chain of evidence. What he thinks you should have is a kind of rigorous system, a database of evidence, but there's got to be the chain of evidence. So basically, if, you're, if someone asks you to show the document that you think refers to something important in the argument, then you should be able to find that and produce it later on. Whether you'd be asked to do that in real life is a moot point, probably not, but the chain of evidence should be there um, so that you can defend basically whatever it is you've said and show the evidence to support it. So that's worth thinking about. Get organised in terms of producing the evidence. How are you going to do it? What kind of filing system kind of are you going to have? And how are you going to maintain a chain of evidence? So those are some of the issues about how to do it. Um, when you're writing up, though, I would always try to put yourself in the reader's shoes and think the, of the reader as a sceptical person. Um, in other words, the person is perhaps sceptical about whether you've got the evidence to support the argument you're um, making. The, the reader might be, have doubts about the reliability and validity of what it is you're saying. If you're relying upon interview data, they may be questioning whether in fact you're being told the truth. You need to think of that sceptical reader and ultimately in writing up the case, you're trying to persuade the reader, of course, of what you're saying, of the truth of your argument. Um, and that sometimes requires careful uh, consideration. The example that we gave, um, and hopefully you've read, is, is 
an interesting one. And to what extent is it convincing? I'll leave you to judge as a reader. But what, think about what makes it convincing. Is it the number of interviews? Is it the way in which it is presented? Um, so when, in writing up, um, you've got to convince the sceptical reader. I mean, writing up is always an exercise in persuasive communication, but case study research, I think, requires that um, to a high degree. Address the limitations. Any case study research will have limitations. You're not going to have collected all the possible data that you could have. You're not going to have interviewed everyone necessarily who's relevant and so on. So address those limitations in the write-up. The, the, all research actually is limited and you can get credit as a student for acknowledging those limitations. And the final point I'd make in writing up is beware of this business about writing for multiple audiences, particularly if your boss has kind of almost commissioned this research for you as a student. There can be a danger that in writing up the report you think you'll ple you're doing something for your boss and you're doing something for um, the academics who are marking your dissertation. But those two audiences may require very different things, so be careful of that. Sometimes it's better to have two reports, one for your boss and one for the, for the academic audience. In terms of the how to do research, Yin presents this kind of diagram. And I'm not going to go through each point in this diagram and the chain, but you can see the complexity of it. And the point is that it's not a simple linear process. In other words, some of those arrows are going kind of in reverse, if you like, and we're um, moving around these different phases. And that's the nature, I think, of case study research. It's not a simple linear process. It's actually a complex iterative process with feedback loops and so on. And that's the complex nature of case study research, but we do it in order to try to capture the complex nature of reality, of the context, of the issue that we're looking at in its context. So finally, the conclusion is that it seems to me that case studies research definitely can produce interesting results. Um, it can produce what Yin refers to as analytical generalization um, and theory. Ethnographic research produces theory. I've given you one example of case study research, which I think is quite interesting, but obviously there are hundreds of examples out there that produce interesting results. So definitely it can produce something useful. But clearly, as I've, I hope I've kind of demonstrated really, it's not necessarily an easy option. There's lots of different decisions to make about how you're going to do this case study. Even during the case study data collection, you're probably having to make decisions. And it shouldn't be entered lightly. It shouldn't be seen as an easy option. Um, it's actually quite a difficult option, but may be worth doing. Case studies, because they're not easy, take a bit of time. You will need to collect data, quite a lot of data. And it's not something that can be done in a couple of weeks, usually. Um, it needs careful thinking th through and a lot of work and effort. Uh, however, having said that, there are lots of examples of case study done by students within a semester. So uh, my general tip would be don't think you can do it in the last week of the semester, you know, just before you're giving the dissertation in. But if you organised as a student and can give it the full semester to you know, get yourself organised, collect the data, write it up, then it certainly can be possible. Um, but the other issue is, going back to whether case study is a method, I don't think it is a method because you can use lots of different methods within it. Um, case study is, research is a field, if you like, you're looking at one field of study or two fields if you're comparing and one or two cases. Um, but that means that you have to pay attention to all the other lectures that it, within this uh, module. That all the different methods of data collection, ethnography, surveys and so on can be used within the case study uh, research that you may be doing. 
So that's how I'd see it. You need to see this lecture in the context of all the other lectures because you've got to decide which other methods of data collection to use, even if you've decided to use case study research. So I, I do strongly think that case study research has a lot going for it and lots of good reasons for doing it. And in fact, in different traditions, from a more kind of positivist tradition of that Yin comes from to a more uh, qualitative um, interpretivist tradition that a lot of ethnography comes from, I think case study research makes a lot of sense. It can work for students as well, but it needs careful thinking through and lots of decisions to be made about how you do it. So I hope that's been useful, but it needs to be set in the context of the other lectures on this series as well. Thanks.